Divine Truth Theme Discussions Discussions between Jesus and Mary about specific topics and issues This is Session 11, Part 3 of the discussion God's Laws of Forgiveness and Repentance where Jesus and Mary continue to discuss God's principles and laws of forgiveness and repentance still focusing on the human conscience explaining the external influences that affect and control the development of a desire to listen to and act upon truth received by the conscience. The session was recorded on the 10th of January 2018 from 10.30 a.m. in Wilkesdale, Queensland, Australia. Well, now we're up to the third of our external influences that affect uh, our conscience. And that is societal emotions and beliefs. And they mm. impact our desire for conscience. Mm. So let's have a chat about that. Yeah, well, obviously, since my family is affected by society, it makes sense that, you know, my family grew up in the society. So obviously the society must have an effect on the family. And this is why, like, if you grow up in an Arabic country, mm -hmm. you most probably be Muslim. And if you grow up in a in a Western country, you'll most probably be Christian. Mm -hmm. and, and it's changing now as, yeah. as people change, but and as society changes. But if you grow up in China, it's most likely if you've grown up in the last 50 years in China, you'd be a communist. Yeah. And most likely if you've grown up in Russia, you might not have too much connection to religion at all. And if you've grown up in Africa, it's most likely that you'll have a combination of a Christian faith along with some kind of um, you know, African-based uh, spiritualist type of yeah. religion that determines what's going on in your society. So, so obviously society is having an impact on you. If you're growing up in every one of these different countries mentioned, each one has a different type of political regime. And mm. Each one has a different type of uh, way of looking after medicine or medical issues and, and so forth. So obviously these all have an impact on the family, these choices and decisions. Yes, and it sort of works both ways, doesn't it? Families impact upon societies, society impacts upon families, and it's a sort of, we can't talk about one without the other, really, can Not we? Not really, no, because, uh, because uh, you know, as, as you know, like a family does determine to a great degree the, the religious faith of the next generation. Mm -hmm. and, and how you've grown up in society to a great degree does determine what, what values you inculcate into your children so therefore what values are given to the next generation yeah. so so obviously society is having a huge impact on on what happens to you as a child mm. and therefore uh, now as an adult how much you're willing to remain connected to your conscience god's truth yeah. versus society's truth yeah which is not often truth but is rather frequently um, you know, various degrees of error-based emotional beliefs that have been imposed upon the society at large. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right. And that, that includes as well, say I've grown up in a society, and, but then I move to another country or another society, if you like. I'm still going to be largely impacted, aren't I, by the society that I've grown up in? Frequently, yeah. you're, you're comparing the two societies yes. internally when you're living in another society. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a natural thing to do yeah. because you, you've grown up one way and now you're being presented with another way. Yeah. And uh, frequently you can see, oh, wow, there's some good things in this other way and there's bad things in this other way. You yeah. know? And frequently then you can begin to see that there's good things in your way and bad things in your way too. Yeah. And, and oftentimes you get to see the differences between different types of societies. And there's some things you'll like in one and dislike in another. Yeah. Mm. But would you say it's fair to say that my desires are going to be largely impacted upon by that um, the one you primary grew up in. society that I grew up in? That's right. Uh, but then it may be influenced by the desire of the other society, but none of that is the conscience anyway. That's right. Yeah. None of that is the conscience. And, and at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you know, the, what happened from the time we were born to the time we were seven years of age has a large impact upon the future decisions and choices that we're going to make. And the key is to release a lot of the emotional injuries from that time of our life because that's going to free us up to make decisions that are wise and also be more in connection with our conscience. Yeah. Obviously, society has had a large impact during that period of my life. Yeah, mm. yeah. All right, so now let's talk about societal influence from those two aspects, those two... Um, areas so how how does society influence my current sensitivity to the conscience 
Well, here we could almost cut and paste yes. <laughs> family uh, influences and put yeah. them into society influences yeah. and just say the same thing, basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, obviously there's certain things in society I disagree with, mm -hmm. uh, which I will probably rebel against. Yeah. And there's certain things in society I agree with, so therefore I'll probably accept and yep. and act in harmony with and act in harmony with and even uh, share with others and allow that to influence my desires yes yeah and it certainly will influence all of my desires mm -hmm. now bearing in mind that either way whether we're connected uh, you know through rebellion or connected through agreement yeah we're still connected yeah and therefore still really relating everything that goes on in our personal life through the viewpoint of society mm -hmm. rather than through god's viewpoint yeah so this, of course, is going to detune me from God's truth about what's happening in every situation. Yeah, mm. yeah. Okay. Um, and as we mentioned in the previous um, section, society is going to influence me more than I realise because I, I, my behaviour is now emotionally governed by these beliefs. So right. even if I'm not having a thought process about it, pretty much my emotions are going to be have been affected and uh, will want to pull me in certain directions in harmony with those beliefs of the society. Yes, and this is why it's very interesting when you travel. Yeah. Because you, you get to live in another society where different things are normal. Mm -hmm. Like if, if you go here in Australia, it's, it's normal to go and get some alcohol with a drive through. <laughs> in other words, we, you know, people stay in their car and they drive into the alcohol shop and they say, can you give me this, that and this? And the guy goes and gets it for you and dumps it in your car and then off you drive and you just pay him and off you drive. A drive through bottle yeah. is called here in Australia, is very, very normal. Now, in other cultures, obviously, it's not normal at all. No. And, but, but you go to America and a drive through bank is normal. Yeah. <laughs> you drive through, you just do your thing, you talk them over the thing, you bank, it's a drive through teller. Yeah. Um, so that's very normal. <laughs> does that probably show something a little bit about the priorities inherent in each society? <laughs> it does to a degree. It does to a degree. Uh, here in Australia, obviously, our priority is a lot about drinking <laughs> um, in many cases. And, and in America, obviously, it is a lot about um, wealth, you know, in yeah. terms of generating economic wealth. So, so obviously, how the society acts and what we view as normal is quite mm -hmm. determined by it. Here in Australia, we have fairly good selection of goods, mm -hmm. but in America, there is a huge variety of goods. And when you get used to a huge variety, when you come to Australia, you think, wow, there's no variety. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if we went to somewhere in, the, in, in Africa or, or the Middle East, for that matter, mm -hmm. or a lot of the, some of the poorer Asian countries, um, you might find there's hardly any variety and you'll be used to that too. Yeah. So uh, a lot of what we get, we get used to things mm. growing up in the environment mm -hmm. is what we're saying here. And those, the, what we're used to determines our emotional condition yeah. to a large degree. Yeah. So now what we're used to is also what we either rebel against or what we agree with. Yeah. And we'll do one of the two. So we're still connected to the society. Yeah. And, uh, and we still have a certain way of thinking and acting. So that connection means I'm less connected with the conscience. Yes, well, every time the society disagrees with God's viewpoint of a truth, then my natural response is going to agree with the society. Yeah. And yeah. every time God's truth uh, agrees with society, obviously there's going to be a strong motivation to maintain those societal beliefs. But... But when there's a disagreement, that's where I rise. That's where the problems are arise, right, arise in yeah. my life. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So that's how my current sen sensitivity is affected. What about my desire to develop a sensitivity to my conscience? Well, obviously, again, we could almost cut and paste the f f familial emotions mm -hmm. and put them into the society emotions. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of societies have a very violent reaction to a person who disagrees with the society's general belief systems yeah. and you see you can see this quite intensely wherever you go on the planet and you know the more we travel you and I the more we see it don't we it's like you see it every new place you visit you can see the society's influence on individuals yes. and how much it detunes them from their own conscience as to what God's truth is on those particular matters definitely and you can see where um there's certain areas where the society might be more open mm -hmm. um, to certain aspects of God's of truth, truth. Uh, but completely closed in others. Correct. And in other countries, it might be the, the flip. 
Yes. If the same issue, they're yeah. quite close. That the other society is open to this one. This society is quite closed. Yeah. Uh, but they're quite open to another aspect that the previous society was completely closed. Exactly. To. And anywhere where society is open to God's truth, then obviously you'll be open to your own conscience. Yes. Anywhere where your society is closed to God's truth on a matter, mm -hmm. you're going to be closed to your conscience. Yes. So it, uh, it's going to have quite a, a large effect on your life yeah. if you remain connected to society in this way. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we need you need to change that so yeah. so that God, your connection with God's truth is pri has the priority. Yeah. And then you examine you know everything through that connection you have with God's truth. So my, but my lack of desire to put it as a priority uh, is often to do with the level of um, perceived threat that I sense from my society. Which often is very intense. Mm -hmm. it, it could result in your death, mm. actually, in many societies. Yeah. Uh, even now on earth, it could result in death in many societies. Yeah. So it's not like we've progressed that much from with the time we were first here on earth. Because, you know, in the first century, yeah, if you had a, a, a disagreement with the society viewpoint, you didn't last very long. It's the reason why I only lasted three and a half years after I started really expressing God's viewpoint about society yeah. issues. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's a normal course of events for most people because, because you're in so much confrontation with society every single day and confrontation with your family every single day. Sooner or later, somebody is going to plot your death. death yeah. <laughs> and, and this is still an unfortunate truth in many societies today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it is. Yeah. All right, let's talk about some examples then. Yep. Conscious societal emotions and desire for peace. Mm -hmm. So here we wanted to raise this itch issue about war and being going to war and wanting peace or wanting to be a pacifist mm. and how... Um, I, don't, I feel that too, a pacifist is not the right word for a person who wants peace. You, Could you explain? Well, a pacifist sort of it tends to indicate that you're, you're, you're passive about things rather than active about things. Mm -hmm. A person who truly wants peace is very active in their life at, at showing and, how, and displaying how that's going to be achieved. Sure. They're not a person who just retires into their own backyard and, <laughs> and, and does nothing to confront any, any, anybody. Yeah. You know, a true... A true peace per, a person who's peaceful mm -hmm. is, is like um, like a leader of peace yes not not a pacifist yes and so i think uh, it, 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 pa the word pacifist is not a good word to portray right. what god's view of peace is <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. okay fair mm. enough uh, yeah cool okay so talk to us about um peace and conscience yes now if we examine the motivations of war of course there's many and many of those motivations are society based in the sense that the whole society agrees with a certain perspective or opinion. Mm -hmm. And then when another society has a disagreement with their society and is willing to take up arms in order to defend or attack based on that, uh, that uh, belief system, then your society is willing to defend itself. Mm -hmm. And then there's people inside of society, of course, who support the defense of the society itself. Mm -hmm. as as an act of loyalty to country or loyalty to a way of life yeah. and these particular loyalties when you connect to your conscience are uh, are, are basic, basically god dismisses most of these loyalties as misguided and so what happens is now if you are connected to your conscience you are now not going to go to war it's highly likely that one of two things will happen. Firstly, the culture in which you live is going to be disappointed with you and attack you and abuse you and perhaps imprison you or even kill you mm -hmm. for making that decision. Or the country that you're in war against is, <laughs> is going to overrun you and kill you anyway. <laughs> Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And it sort of gets you into this position where you, where you almost feel that uh, no matter what you do, the end result is probably not going to be very good. And as a result of that, we become quite frightened. Mm -hmm. And once we're frightened, we then consider and usually act upon not agreeing with our conscience mm. and actually going ahead and taking the societal line of things. Mm. Now, there's been many good movies about this particular problem, obviously, in, in times gone past and even recent movies uh, that have demonstrated that as a problem. Yeah. But you can see that there is a direct link now between me 
holding on to my conscience viewpoint, which is God's viewpoint of truth about going to war with people, and then me being confronted uh, by the fact that uh, I'm probably going to be placed in fearful situations now yeah. uh, by the society, even the society in which I live, mm-hmm. or the society which is attacking me, yeah. um, in order to, uh, uh, to see whether I'm going to really uphold these peaceful principles, these peaceful principles yeah. that the conscience is telling me I need to uphold. And so obviously it's going to be a very, very difficult time for me to work through those particular things until I've worked through my fears and my distress about death and a number of other things. And then, of course, I'll probably uphold my conscience, the connection with God's truth Mm -hmm. rather than the societal truth. Mm -hmm. Got to. Our second example is conscience, societal emotions and addictions. So here we wanted to talk about feeding emotional and physical addictions of members of our society, didn't we? Yes, well, most societies have the viewpoint. And it's very interesting when we go from society to society when you're traveling, because they all have a different addiction or demand of what you do. (laughs) So what what, what we might do here in Australia would be very, very different to what a person might do in the USA. And that might be different to Brazil. And that might be different to the Middle East. And that might be different to Europe. And that might be different to England. And that might be different. And and it's quite interesting when you travel, isn't Mm -hmm. it? Because you get to see how many different emotional addictions are at play and how certain societies have very similar emotional addictions. And and what, what we even notice is things like many of the Arab countries and the USA have very similar emotional addictions, yes. ironically. Yeah. And so you can feel that they're just in different directions, yeah. but they're the same kind of addiction. Yeah. And you see that quite frequently operating. And, and so what you end up uh, through this process of travel, you start seeing that, wow, societies have what you would classify as society-based addictions mm-hmm. about what is the right way, the, the concept the loving. The, of what love is, yes. is quite different. And what is the right way to treat a person? And uh, obviously, in some societies, the right way to treat a person is to agree with them all the time. <laughs> and, uh, in other societies, the right way to treat them is to honour them as superior to you. You know, that's very much the case in Asian and Ara- mm. Arabic societies. Other societies, are, it's the right, you honour what they do. You know, mm-hmm. so, so you see that a lot in Western society. You honour the position they hold or the education they have or whatever. But, you know, uh, but in other societies, it doesn't matter what education they have. It's the position they hold in the family or, uh, that, or in the society that's more important and so mm-hmm. forth. The problem with all that, of course, is that all you have to do is not feed one addiction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> depending on the society in which you are. Yeah. Now, now, obviously, from God's perspective, when we're listening to our conscience, feeding any addiction is a problem. Mm -hmm. And the conscience will always bother you when you feed any addiction of another person or your own addictions. Now, that creates a problem no matter what society you're in. And you can go from society to society to society and you can create different problems just by not feeding somebody's addiction in the society and get yourself in a lot of hot water and, and, and potentially even uh, have your life threatened as a result. And, and you could actually die in some societies as a result of your inability to feed their addictions. Yeah. Now, a person, again, uh, would need to have this connection to their conscience uh, as the most highest priority in their life if they are actually going to get to the point where they're not going to respond to feeding the addictions of any member of society and just live their life the way God's truth Mm -hmm. that they're hearing through their conscience is telling them to live. Yeah, and obviously the fear of that attack and the uh, the fear of an entire society judging you as unloving can be quite substantial in causing people not to want to to even have a desire to know about the conscience or feel their conscience. Yes, if we imagine for a moment it's bad enough getting the attack of our family, which is what, just a few people. Imagine that every single person in your country wants mm-hmm. to attack you. Yeah. Uh, that's pretty intense. Yes. And every person in the country would like to see you dead. Yeah. That's pretty intense. Yeah. And you can understand that, you know, that obviously is going to have a huge impact on my willingness and even my desire to hear my conscience at all. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it's, a, it's an intense uh, emotional situation, these kind of societal problems. 
and uh, you'd notice it immensely when you when you go from society to society if you remain connected to god and god's truth you know, through the conscience you'll find confront you'll confront pretty much every society that's on the planet right now yeah will be confronted in major ways that could in the end threaten your own life mm. um so how dedicated are you to god's truth is the real question here yeah how, are you going to stay uphold it under all circumstances or are you going to compromise it from society to society? Yeah. yeah. Which is basically being a chameleon. Are you going to become a chameleon in each society? Which is what most people do when they travel. Mm. Mm. <laughs> as much as they're able. Yeah. <laughs> Our fourth external influence we're going to discuss is soul condition. So soul condition impacts sensitivity to and desire for conscience. Mm. So here we want to remind everyone what we mean by soul condition, don't we? Yes, and basically soul condition is the sum total of my current beliefs, my current emotions and feelings and my current, my current uh, desires and, 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 and intentions. And if you add all that up together and include it in every area or facet of your life, that's your soul condition. Yeah. So every person on this planet has a condition of some kind and, and it's quite individual actually because every person usually has different ways of handling different things. And, and our soul condition involves how we handle men, how we handle women, how we, how we handle adults, how we handle children, how we handle educated people, how we handle uneducated people, what kind of society we're brought up in. And, and, and there's so many facets to it. You could literally list thousands and thousands and thousands of facets to it and still not be exhausted by what makes up your soul condition. Mm -hmm. But here we are, we have a condition. Mm -hmm. This condition has uh, occurred because of all of our history up until this point, which includes all of our experiences, all of our memories, all of our choices, all of the choices of our society and our parents and our childhood experiences all rolled into one. Yeah. Which is now in you or me. Right, so there's our condition. Now, obviously, that's going to have a large effect <laughs> on how we can hear God's condition, yes. God's truth about any matter. Right. If our condition is in a large amount of disharmony with God's condition, then obviously we're going to struggle to hear God's truth. If our condition is in more harmony with God's condition, then we're going to be open to hearing God's truth through the conscience. Mm. 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 All right. Well, let's look at how this, it's a, as you just explained, it's an, a condition that's developed over time, isn't yeah. it? So... Let's look at how this developed condition affects our current sensitivity to conscience. And again, it's fairly obvious from everything we've discussed so far, yes. but let's have a look at what we've got in our outline. Yep. Um, basically, because of this condition, we've got a lot of addictions, don't we? Which are things that help us avoid emotional discomfort, fear, pain, grief. Uh, all of those things uh, come from a sense of entitlement to get certain things very often. Um, yeah. And also comes from a, a desire to uphold an image of ourselves, yes. our facade. Yes. So, you know, our addictions are, are great, uh, greatly assist us to, <laughs> to continue our facade. <laughs> and pretty much our beliefs about the addiction, our, any of our addictions are, Look, it's better to meet this addiction, have have some short term pleasurable experience, pleasurable. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you know, it's not true pleasure, but no. it feels like something better than those other emotions I'm trying to avoid. That's right. Yeah. So we value meeting those addictions yes. above um, looking at what the conscience has to say, but also above looking at the long-term effects of meeting that addiction in the short term yeah the pain and suffering cause yeah. so if we like we said in our previous session we said that our addictions scream and yell at us you know yeah. they, they are very very you noisy. actually scream <laughs> yeah, yeah. i did actually scream <laughs> to demonstrate that so so our addictions are very noisy they are constantly demanding our attention and our and the satisfaction of them and as a result of that, we are, we, it's the thing we listen to the most, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is that we're quite detuned from listening to our conscience because our conscience is a, is a soul-based function that's not screaming at us. Yeah. It's, it's, it's there just informing, informing, mm -hmm. informing. 
And as I illustrated yesterday, you have one person who's just informing you and another person screaming at you and they're both in the same room. Which one do you listen to? Yeah. <laughs> it's highly likely you'll be listening to the one who's screaming you and you can't even hear the one who's informing yeah. you. And that's really what we're like with our addictions. Yeah. We, we listen to them, we act upon them, and it doesn't matter uh, oftentimes what the long-term effect is. And because a long term with every addiction, whether it's physical, emotional, sexual or spiritual, and we can have addictions in every facet of life, mm -hmm. whatever the addiction is, it's going to lead us to pain and suffering. Yeah. But we're, we're so uh, we're so insistent on just listening to that screaming voice mm. without considering the long term effects of it. Yes. And we often think that not meeting that addiction is the painful it's thing that I, that I need to avoid at all costs. <laughs> exactly. So I yeah. get myself into this worsening, developing condition, don't I? Because right. I'm continually doing that. I'm continually acting upon my addictions, which means acting upon my unloving behaviour, which yeah. creates more unloving behaviour, which degrades my condition even further. Yeah. And that, of course, detunes me from my conscience even more. Yes. Yeah. And uh, if I have addictions to avoid attack, and uh, ridicule and abuse, which given what we've just said about society fam familial and <laughs> uh, influence and societal influence, yeah. I'm probably I'm bound to have some addictions about avoiding attack of and course. displeasure and rejection. Um, so if I've got this situation with my addictions where I think it's far better to meet them rather than deny them, and I have addictions about avoiding attack, and I know that if I go in disharmony with my family and society, I'll get, you know, to follow my conscience, I'll get attacked. Then I'm pretty likely to detune from my conscience and just avoid yeah. attack. Yeah, the answer is ignore my conscience. Yeah, of, <laughs> easy. Yeah. It, unfortunately, it's not easy because it creates more pain and suffering. Exactly. So it actually creates more hardship. But yes. that's not the way you're thinking at the time. No. In the short term, you think this is the best. It's, it's amazing, isn't it, how... Um, we have such a, a low level of tolerance for a short period of discomfort. Yes, like immediate pain. Immediate pain or immediate fear. Yeah. Um, but we're willing to live with prolonged states of ill suffering. health, discomfort, <laughs> yes. suffering, low yeah. level anxiety, high level anxiety, yeah. all those Even things. Even die Depression. from diseases that we don't need to die from. Yes, for a long, long <laughs> period. I often think about that in yeah. relation to fear. like. Okay, I can confront this fear right now. I have my terror right now. Or I'm going to have to live with that fear in me and feel like uncomfortable day after, day, and after, after day, day after day. So uh -huh. it's sort of, you know. Like I'm going through that at the moment with some of my fears yeah. and it's just like, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, as we've said, since our lives are primarily governed by addictions, it's nigh on impossible for us to hear our conscience right now that's right and my, well i shouldn't say nigh on impossible well it is yeah. pretty close to yeah, yeah. um you've got to really stop start confronting your addictions and getting rid of them before you have you'll hear a conscience and some of those desires we talked about in our in session 10 of desire even for ethics is going to cause us to want to confront some of our addictions of course, of yeah. course yeah. yeah so the other thing is the addictions tell you also the opposite thing and that is that it's pain that dissatisfying them is painful so, yes. so they're telling you the opposite as than truth. The truth is satisfying addiction creates pain and suffering, right? That's God's truth. Yeah. Your truth is satisfying my addictions brings me pleasure, not pain and suffering. Yeah. That's my truth. And if I dissatisfy my addictions, that's going to bring me pain and suffering. Yeah. That's, that's what we believe is true. Yeah. So we believe completely the opposite thing to what the conscience is suggesting. It's going to be pretty hard to listen to the conscience, yes. bearing in mind that these addictions scream so loud and they're also saying the untruth so loud. And so that's why it's very difficult yeah. when you have addictions to actually listen to your conscience. Yeah, mm. great. All right, so now let's look at how that developed emotional condition um, affects our desire to develop any sensitivity to the conscience. And again, this very similar things apply to they. Yeah, so like when I'm, when I'm so sensitive to my addictions, and of course I don't need to be that sensitive to they're yeah. screaming their head off anyway. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> so I'm constantly trying to feed them, yeah. constantly trying to satisfy them. My whole life is embroiled in this satisfaction of addiction. Yeah. Now, to change that and say, no to yourself 
no, I'm not going to satisfy these addictions anymore. And instead, I'm going to release from me the reasons why I have them. That's a pretty hard choice to make mm -hmm. when your addictions are screaming at you and you feel good about satisfying them. Yeah. Right. So, so it's highly unlikely you're going to have a very strong desire while you're feeding your addictions to actually get rid of them and listen to your conscience instead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, so your desire for your conscience is going to be severely suppressed while you feed your addictions. Yeah. Yep. And, yeah. and you've experienced that and everyone I know has experienced that. You feed your addictions, you're not going to hear your conscience. That's right. Similarly, if I mm. feed the addictions of everyone around me, a, a very similar thing happens. Yep. where I'm, I'm acting to please others or give them what they want. So my primary um, motivation is give others what they want. Don't listen to what my conscience is telling me. Exactly. Do what I, my <clears throat> environment demands. Ignore my conscience. Yes. Respond to whatever situation I'm in, especially if there's pressure. Uh, it's very, very difficult to hear your conscience under those circumstances. It is. If you, if you have a priority system inside of yourself to avoid terror or fear, you will find that you can't hear your conscience yeah. at all. And you're not, because we're speaking here about developing that desire for, to hear it, we're not, it's going to be very, very hard to... To even have a desire. To have a desire to yeah, be because sensitive. Because all we're, we're constantly in this terror going, I've got to satisfy what other people want. I've got to do what other people want. Because if I don't, they're going to hurt me. They're going to yeah. attack me. They're going to make me feel bad. They're going to make me feel guilty. They're going to make me feel all these things I don't want to feel. So I'm just going to keep doing it. I'm going to do it. And this is internally... I know I did all that very rapidly, yeah. but that's how you think internally yes, as well. Definitely. So it doesn't even give you enough time to yes. stop and pause Yes. And, may, and say, maybe there's something wrong with this. Yeah. <laughs> maybe I'm uh, having an addiction <laughs> going on here. Because addictions are like that. They try to speed up your life mm -hmm. in such a way that you've got no time to stop and pause and contemplate the results of them. Yes. That's how That's they are. very true. Mm. Yeah. 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 All right. So that's why it's going to be hard to develop that desire. Um, when God's telling me via the conscience to develop a desire to change, I'm often going to ignore that in favour of maintaining the relationship with the people around me, the people who are either going to attack me if I disagree with me, disagree with them or agree with me, or approve of me if I agree with them. Correct. Which is or, sad, isn't it? Isn't it, is. it? Because all my life becomes is uh, just seeking approval or, or avoiding attack. And at the end of the day, do I really have any good relationships at all if that's all my life is? No. Of course not. No. And yet my desire is going to be to do that because I'm so afraid of doing anything else. Yeah. And therefore, I'll be also saying, conscience, I don't want to listen to my conscience. <laughs> you know, like, oh, it's, just a, it's just going to be a fly in the ointment yeah. of this life that I've already constructed for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and we've talked a lot about fear, haven't we? But we should probably mention some other addictions, which are sort of things like, I, I will probably mention some of them in our examples, but yeah. things like when we want to be superior to others, sometimes there's not a lot of fear involved in that, no, no. but we feel like it's going to be very painful to give it up. To give up, yeah. So and, we'll talk about these things yeah. in the examples, I think. Yeah, but that's, it, there's a lot of different examples we could list here, thousands of them, of yes. course. Because, uh, you know, there's as many so examples as there are addictions. Yes. <laughs> so, and there's many, many thousands of them. So, um, you know, we could list thousands, but obviously we're not going to have the time to do that. So we'll mention five or six of them. But, but the, you can see that some of the addictions are addictions to remain feeling higher or more important than others, as well as addictions to being feeling like you're subservient or less mm -hmm. than others. Mm -hmm. and, and they can have a vi wide variety of different areas of our life could be affected by these addictions, yeah. including our physical life. So addictions to food and clothes and, and uh, drink, alcohol, substances such as drugs, right the way through to emotional addictions, you know, addictions to feeling good about yourself and feeling that other people should make you feel good about yourself and and the addictions that go enter into the sexual realm like feeling like you need to be in a submissive role or a superior role or or, or you know or or feeling that you're ashamed of sexuality or whatever 
And then, you know, there's so many addictions in so many areas of life. You can see that uh, unless you're willing to challenge them, um, every one of the areas where you're not willing to challenge, it's like God's voice won't even be heard anymore. Yeah. Like, you're not going to listen and you're not even going to pretend, potentially desire even to listen. Because yeah. when you do desire to listen, you hear, and then when you hear it, you go, oh, it's in disagreement with what I think and what I want. And then you go, then you have to make a decision. Well, am I going to keep doing what I want or am I just going to agree or and follow what the conscience is telling me? And that yeah. becomes a very difficult decision when it comes to personal addictions because personal addictions are not like demands from external demands like family or society demands. Family or society demands you can get away from to a certain degree, degree unless you're imprisoned by them. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but with your addictions, you are imprisoned by them. Yes. They are with you every single moment of your waking and sleeping life. And until you get rid of them, that's, they, they are like a constant prison you're carrying around on your back, you know, dictating to your, you your rest of your life. So they're mm -hmm. so very unique in that way. Mm -hmm. And so your soul condition, which is the area we're looking at here, has a very large effect on whether you'll hear your conscience or even desire to hear it. Yeah. 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 Okay, let's look at some examples. Conscience, soul condition and fear of attack. So here we want to talk about how this developed condition that I have, that includes a fear of attack, is going to inhibit me from being sensitive to my conscience, uh, or having a desire for conscience. And we've we've talked a lot about this so far in this whole discussion. Yes, obviously uh, a lot of our a lot of our desires are based around fear of attack. In other words, we try to avoid things that are going to pardon me, cause people to attack me and at the same time do things that are going to uh, you know help me avoid the attack. Yeah. So so the the problem here let's let's give me more specific about the example. So, so here, let's say it's an example where I have the opportunity to share the truth with, with say, a friend mm -hmm. who, who, whose partner's cheating on them, mm -hmm. right? That's your favourite example. Right. You often it's an easy one. example yeah. to yeah. choose, and it frequently happens. Yeah. <laughs> so, so fortunately, it's a good example to use because of those reasons. <laughs> but uh, but if, you, if, you, if you examine that situation, the majority of people would be afraid of, firstly, what they're friend might say to them, mm -hmm. or what the person who's cheating on the friend will say to them, mm -hmm. and feel that they're interfering with the relationship in mm -hmm. some way. So that's all about their own guilt and how they've been brought up to think that interfering by stating truth is interference, Yes, right? yeah. which is a lot about their parents' beliefs and society's yeah. beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. And all of that gets mixed together in their mind yes. and, and therefore higher, gets higher and higher and higher in priority. Yeah. And yet God's voice is saying, tell them, tell them, tell yeah. them, tell them the truth, yeah. right? In the sideline there. Now, highly unlikely the person who's afraid of all those other things is going to tell their yeah. friend the truth. Yeah, I was just, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered another yeah. example. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, years ago we had lunch with some people and um, that we didn't know very well. And the man was saying, tell, told us a story where he, basically his, he was on a bit of a spiritual journey and at one point, quite likely his conscience said, said, led him to the point where he felt like, no, telling the truth is the right way to go. And uh, he told us a story when his neighbour came and brought him and his wife a cake. And uh, she left and they tried the cake and he thought the cake was pretty terrible, actually. And she came back to get the plate or whatever a few days later and said, did you like the cake? And he thought, well, I've got to tell the truth. And he said, uh, no, not very much, actually. <laughs> I didn't think it was such a good cake. <laughs> and he was saying um, pretty much his, that was eight or ten years ago. His neighbour has never forgiven him. <laughs> she sort of like, is it, she doesn't, she still speaks to him, but she can, he can tell she still holds it against him. Yeah. And basically that was his foray into telling the truth at all times. That was enough for him to enough. sort of abandon, <laughs> abandon it as a principle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I do. 
<laughs> so it was and you, it was you've funny. lived you've lived with me long enough and seen so many people respond to me saying the truth yeah even when they ask for it it's yeah. like even sharing the truth to somebody who asks for it most of the time a person who asks for truth is is loading their questions <laughs> yes. with the de- with the demand that you you know agree with them in some way yeah and you've seen so many times where a person's done that to me and i've mm. told them the truth and We've never heard from them or seen them again. And in a lot of time, a lot of times they've spent the rest of their life, even to this day, attacking mm-hmm. us as a result. Yeah. So, you know, it's a it's a very common problem yes. <laughs> where yes. people will are willing to revert to attack just because they've heard the truth. Yeah. And so naturally, with this problem, if my soul condition demands that I avoid attack, which most people's soul condition does demand, yeah. which is how society gets lubricated in many ways. Yeah. And most of us are going around very, very, with a lot of uh, effort trying to just avoid attack every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately, our life becomes so complicated yeah. as a result of it as well. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Conscious soul condition and selfishness. So he would like to talk about a specific example relating to soul condition and selfishness and how that brings us out of harmony with conscience. Yeah, well, let's look at it firstly generally. We can see that if I have a selfish desire and my conscience is telling me that it is selfish, so God's saying basically through the mechanism of the conscious, hey, you're being selfish now. If I have a strong desire to satisfy that selfish desire, I'm probably going to ignore my conscience. Mm. So I'm probably going to say, no, I'll go ahead and do this anyway. Now, this frequently happens with sexual things Mm -hmm. because most people, once the sexual desire kicks in, it becomes so insistent for most people that they can't avoid it, right? except by acting upon it. Like they've got to act upon it, even though the conscience is telling them otherwise. Mm. And, and you frequently see this occurring, you know, where the conscience is telling a person, don't do that. It's going to be bad for your relationship. It's going to be bad for your friendships. It's going to do these particular, you know, cause these particular problems. But you go ahead and do it anyway. Yeah. And then in the morning you wake up next to the person and you go, what the hell am I here for? <laughs> because your addiction demanded you're there yeah and you didn't listen to your conscience that's why you're there (laughs) because your your addictions were more important than your conscience yes (laughs) that's why you're there you know and and you know this is where something that we need to get out of if we're going to progress but unfortunately for the majority of us what we do instead is we just switch off the conscience and go ahead with the addiction yeah Mm. yeah okay (laughs) conscience soul condition and superiority so what would you like to say about this? Well, God, God, God is very sensitive to when you treat your brothers and sisters, all God's children are classified as God, by God as your brothers and sisters. So whenever you treat your brothers and sisters as if they are inferior to you, and this even includes your own children, because from God's point of view, they are your brother and sister. Mm. And God obviously has a lot to say about that, <laughs> you know, through the mechanism of the conscience. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so God's going to say to us, well, hang on a second, no, this is wrong. You're not treating them with equality. And, and the fact that you want to remain superior mm-hmm. means that you have to have an inferior person that you believe is inferior feed your addiction to be superior. Mm. So in other words, you feed off inferior people when you have superiority so people who believe that they're inferior or are willing to accept that they are are. in your company gives you it often people have this feeling of a greater sense of control over others when when not it's not just control either it's a a sense of ah everybody thinks i'm great you know and and i am great i'm better than other people when you think you're better than other people, you also think you should get away with things that other people shouldn't get away with. Mm-hmm. So, so you have a lot of problems with uh, e- equality in other areas of your life as well. So, so, for example, a man who thinks his wife should cook and clean for him all the time has a superiority problem when it comes to gender, right? Yep. A woman who believes the man should go out and work for her, her all the time and make her feel safe has a superiority problem with regard to gender, mm-hmm. right? And these kind of superiority problems, the conscience is constantly saying, no, 
this isn't right to you. Yeah. Now, if you want to meet them and satisfy them, you're going to have to ignore your conscience. And this is what most people, of course, do. Yes. They ignore what the voice, God's voice through the mechanism of the conscience, saying to them, no, you're not treating your partner with equality. You're not treating your children with equality. You're not treating your friends with equality. You're not treating other members of society with equality. You're not treating other races and people in other countries with equality. And, and, it's, and God's voice is saying all of these things through the conscience, and we, to various degrees, depending on the subject, ignore it. Mm -hmm. And if we ignore it, we're obviously not going to be in tune or in harmony with our conscience. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, let's look at the other side, which is conscience, uh, soul condition and inferiority. Yes, this is an interesting one, inferiority, because most people who feel inferior feel that it's actually a good thing to be inferior. Mm -hmm. And and they actually believe in a lot of ways that uh, that it's right for them to be in, feel inferior and so forth. And it, they don't realise the damaging effect of inferiority because it's just as bad as superiority in what it does. Exactly. And some people think oh, I'm being nice by treating myself as inferior. Yeah, I'm, I'm being, being nice to that person. Kind and loving. Yeah. Uh, also, a lot of us decide well it's too scary to do to which is live of course the primary the, motivation <laughs> yes the ethical viewpoint that we're all equal here yeah, yeah. so i'll just say i'm inferior and i'm actually a victim of terrible things and isn't it when challenged a lot of people who have a sense of inferiority that's been instilled in them they often, fight for it they frequently. fight for it yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah which proves it's an addiction right yes yes so so yeah a lot of people desire to maintain uh, this connection with people who feel superior. A, a lot of reasons why, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of psychological reasons why. One of them, of course, is that when you're around a person who feels superior to you, you then can join with their sense of superiority and feel good about yourself and yeah, things like that. There's a lot of psychological reasons for it. The problem is, no matter what the psychological reason, it's all out of harmony with truth, yes. God's truth. So God's truth coming via the conscience is, we all are equal, which means that if I feel inferior to you, I already have an equality problem and, and I'm not being equal mm -hmm. with you mm -hmm. and I'm not treating myself as equal to you and I'm not treating you, you as equal to me either. So for God's person, for per, uh, point of view, it's a, it's a bad problem yeah. that I need to remedy and the conscience is telling me that. Yeah. But here am I going, well, if I do that, you know, that person, uh, like, if I if I don't go along with the person who's the you know top dog, yeah, the person who you know feels superior, then that person might attack me and belittle me, and all of his mates might attack me and belittle me, and I'll feel really bad about myself, and I don't want to feel bad about myself, which is the primary reason why I want to feel inferior all the time, mm -hmm. and I don't want to go through the emotion of feeling bad about myself, so instead I'll just believe I'm bad and and then get my addiction met by feeding the superiority of others yes and instead of seeing it as an addiction i see it as a sort of way of life yeah and i ignore completely my conscience yes and uh, it's a very damaging thing to do to yourself but also to society yeah mm. conscience soul condition and loving without fear mm. loving without fear interesting uh way of saying it isn't it yeah. like almost f for every person almost on earth and in the spirit world up until the sixth fear, fear is involved in loving. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, anytime fear is involved in loving, it's not really love anymore. No. It's other, you know, addictions driving the so-called loving arrangement or loving, you know, process. So from God's perspective, if you have fear, love doesn't exist. So that's what the conscience is telling you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but see, most people don't believe that. Most people, in fact, believe that if somebody looks after my fear, then they love me. Mm. Or if somebody agrees with my fear, they love me. If someone supports me in my fear, they love me. If somebody um, agrees with my fear of circumstances and situations, then they love me and they are considerate of me and yeah. so forth. Society has huge amounts of problems with this concept of what real love is and love being without fear. Yes. And so what happens in, is a, I, go, I get into a situation where I have the potential to love. My conscience says, you could do this. You could do that. 
if you want to be loving, you could do this. Mm -hmm. And what am I going to do? I'm going to say, no, I can't do that because my fear is going to dictate yes. to me yes. what I should do instead. Yeah. And, and it, my fear, in fact, dictates the evil version of love. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's really what fear creates, evil. And, and, by, and, and, it, and, and it's certainly never loving. Mm -hmm. so, so if we think that we're loving but with some fear in it, we're not loving at all. Now, now the average person in society doesn't agree with that. Mm -hmm. So obviously, I'm going to receive attack from family, attack from society. <laughs> my own addictions are saying, screaming at me, going, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that, because my fears are addictions. They're screaming at me. So how likely is it for me to take actions that are loving, truly loving, love without fear, yeah. when all of those other things are going on? For most people in that circumstance, the answer is detune from my conscience yes. and yes. just go ahead with feeding these other demands. Yeah, mm. yeah, very true. Mm. Mm. That brings us to our fifth and final external influence that we're going to discuss today, yep. which is uh, lack of education impacts sensitivity to and desire for conscience. So here we're talking a lot, aren't we, about the lack of knowledge that exists on the planet about the existence of the conscience and how the conscience operates and uh, mm. what the conscience truly is. Mm. Huge amounts of confusion yeah. on the earth about conscience, what it is, how it works, what, how it, uh, what, what it does, what the purpose of it is, mm -hmm. how it makes you feel. There's so many errors yes. about it that yeah. um, you can understand that the majority of people have a deep lack of education, if they have any education at all, mm -hmm. about the conscience itself and how it works. So bearing that in mind, obviously that's going to have an effect on the use of the conscience. So you, we don't see its potential if we don't even understand it's there mm -hmm. or we think it's something different than it is then we're not going to see its full potential or be able to utilise its full potential. So, of course, that's going to have a major effect on how we listen to it and whether we even desire to listen to it, yeah. in fact. Yeah. Bearing in mind, too, that the majority of people believe that the conscience is what causes you to feel bad. Yes. <laughs> and most people are addicted to not feeling bad. Yeah. And there is very little desire to gain the education about yeah. what the conscience actually yeah. is either. Yeah. <laughs> because really what you're thinking is you're going to just gain education about something that's going to make you feel worse about yes. yourself <laughs> than you ever felt before. Yeah. So it's highly unlikely under those circumstances that you'll desire an education. Yes, mm. very true. All right. Well, let's talk about how this lack of education affects our current sensitivity. So obviously, if we don't know something exists, it's very hard to tune into it, isn't it? Of course, yeah. yeah. So that, that's, that's pro probably pretty obvious, but, yeah. uh, but it needs to be said. Obviously, I can't be sensitive to something that I don't know exists. That's right. <laughs> very simply. <laughs> and if I don't know my conscience exists, then how can I be sensitive to yes. it? <laughs> <laughs> also, if I, if I have some conscience, sorry, some concept of the conscience, yep. but I don't really understand how it operates, then I'm not going to use it to, to my benefit, am I? And I'm going no. to be the very fact of a lack of understanding of the conscience means that I'm probably not in touch with the conscience very well. So no. it's not going to work for, mo for most people, it's a hit and miss thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of like one day it worked and I don't know why, really. <laughs> and I followed it. It was quite good. Yeah. The other day uh, I followed this thing that where I was feeling guilty and I thought that was my conscience. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it really worked out bad for me. Yes. So I can't really trust it. Yeah. And, and so when you don't understand what's going on in both of those circumstances that, we, that I just mentioned. Yeah you're highly likely you're going to get to a point where you can't trust yourself, you can't trust your conscience, you don't, you know, you don't feel that it's, it's worth listening to. Yeah. And uh, as a result, it will be a very hit and miss affair that you yeah. have with your own conscience. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but receiving education, like we're giving education to the viewers today, yeah. that gives me the ability, doesn't it, now to immediately become more sensitive to the conscience. That's right. And how it operates and how God's attempting to tell, tell me truth. Yeah, yeah, so the key is to gain some education about it. And obviously education is not much benefit to us without 
experimentation either. Yep. So what we would suggest to people is that they firstly educate themselves about their conscience mm -hmm. and then they experiment with it as well. Yeah. And, and it's the experimentation with it that allows us to convert the knowledge that comes via the conscience yes. into some positive benefit in our life. Yeah. So, so if you're not willing to take risks and make mistakes here, it's highly unlikely too that you're going to engage your conscience. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, and that probably leads us to the second aspect about developing a desire mm. and how a lack of education impacts on the development of desire to tune into the conscience. And I think that obviously if we don't know it's there, it's hard to develop a desire. But what you've just mentioned about being educated um, means that if we're educated that our conscience isn't there just to make us feel terrible or, you know, give us a big guilt and shame trip, um, then obviously that immediately heightens the desire to, to know more about it and to be more sensitive to it. Oh, it's just a truthful mechanism. Yeah. Wow, that could save me a lot of time <laughs> figuring things out. Yeah, and I, and I need to change some of your terminology there because you said it's not just there to make me feel bad or terrible. <laughs> It's not there for at that at all. all. Yeah. <laughs> so, sure. so, you know, we need to understand, you know, if we if we think, oh, it's there for that, but this as well. No, no. It's, it's I, meant, even, I know I what meant you meant. I meant feeling like it's only there to make me feel yeah. bad. Yeah. It's, it, the reality is it, it, it is just God <laughs> sharing truth, facts about things with us. And yeah. isn't that fantastic? Yeah. That God wants to do that. Yeah. And, and if I keep a connection with it, I'll always have some kind of knowledge coming to me that's coming from an external source that I can trust. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. But if I don't believe all that, of course, yeah. then it, and I'm not educated about that, I don't even get some grassroots education about it, yeah. highly unlikely I'll ever develop a desire even to know about it or want to know about it or desire to engage it or obey it. Yeah. Mm. All right. Well, let's quickly look at some small examples we had about lack of education. Mm -hmm. So our first example is conscience, lack of education and seeking truth. Yeah. So here we're basically saying uh, uh, something that is a basic truth and it is I can't seek for something that I'm unaware of. Mm. So the conscience is great because it makes me aware of things. Right. So yeah. that's really wonderful. But firstly, someone needs to tell me that the conscience exists yes. before I can utilize it to become aware of other things. Yeah. Right. So oftentimes what we're now dependent upon, if we can't use our conscience to become aware of truths, we are reliant on other people sharing truths. Now, the problem with that is that people have their own version of truths mm -hmm. and also hardly and very few people on, on Earth and in the spirit world know the truth. Yeah. about things. They think they do, of course, <laughs> but they don't. Mm -hmm. Now, the problem with all that is that I'm then trusting sources, untruthful sources, but, but those people are not trying to be untruthful. They just don't realize they're being untruthful. Yeah. It's, not, it's, not like a, it's not like a malevolent attempt to, to misguide me, mm -hmm. but it, they sincerely believe the truth they teach. But the problem with that is that if I believe them because and, and on, honestly, for most people, the more convinced a person appears to be, the more highly likely yeah. another person is to believe them. Yeah. And and this is the problem when we disconnect from conscience, we're disconnecting from the person who knows all truth. Yes. And instead choosing to connect to people who know a tiny, tiny bit of mm. truth. And that applies whether you're connecting to me or other people. Mm -hmm. God's truth comes via the conscience as a direct mechanism and gives us the ability to know all truth. All truth becomes available to us. And, and, and it's far better for us to rely on that connection and develop that connection than it is to rely on a connection with a person to tell us truth. Mm. Now, I'm not saying that a, tr a person who's telling this tr truth who's influencing me in a loving way isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It's a bad thing. Isn't it's it? not. It, it, it's a good thing that somebody wishes to share truth that they themselves have discovered. What we've got to make sure of is that does God agree with it? Mm. And the conscience mechanism tells us that God agrees with it or not. 
It's, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? I can hear something external to me, and today's discussion is all about sort of external factors and forces, mm. influences. I can hear something external to me, but if I really have those desires that we spoke about in session 10, those longings, uh, I'll be more in tune with my conscience, and so I can hear immediately from God almost, well, not almost, from God, uh, confirmation. Well, confirmation of what I'm hearing. That's right, yeah. and this is a great help to you. Yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's such an ex- amazing thing that you can confirm or deny. Yes, <laughs> God will confirm or deny mm-hmm. truths that you, so-called truths that you hear from other sources, but only if you are in harmony with the way the conscience actually works. Yeah. And that depends on those ish, those primary desires, as we discussed in our previous session. Mm-hmm. The desire for love, desire for truth, desire for humility, desire for faith, desire for morality and desire for ethics. If, if we have them, God can confirm truths to us yeah. that we hear from other sources. That means we don't we can collectively help each other now because what I, one person can find out a truth through their conscience and then and then if all of us were connected to it, what would we all do? We'd all go, is that true, God? And yeah. that goes, God goes, yeah, mate, it's true. <laughs> right? That yeah. has now prevented you from having to go and find that particular truth. Yes. And now you can decide what you are going to do with that particular truth. Yeah, yeah. it's fantastic. Fantastic mm. opportunities are open to us. But unfortunately, um, a lack of education obviously closes down all of those opportunities yeah. to develop the conscience. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay, this example is conscience, lack of education and experimenting with truth. Mm. This is sort of different to the previous example that we gave, which was about just seeking truth. Once truth is sought, then decisions need to be made. (laughs) (laughs) And this is where I see a lot of people fall down. Mm. They will hear some truth and maybe even the conscience confirms that it is true to them. So now God has confirmed that the truth, that's the truth about the matter. What are you going to do? Mm. It's not going to become your own internally until you experiment with it until you engage a process of experimentation. Mm. Mm. And I love that that's come up many times in our conversation uh, in session 10 and 11, really this truth that, okay, I can hear truth via my my conscience, but it doesn't mean I know truth yet. And so it's not, um, this can be a guide for me, my conscience, Mm -hmm. but really God still wants me to be self-responsible which is a concept we spoke about in the um, Third Assistance Group group in 2016, um, which means really having knowledge of truth for myself in my soul. Yes. So how does that truth get into your soul is the real question, isn't it? I've got to experiment. I've got to experiment with it. I've got to go through a process where I eventually engage it in practical day-to-day life, Mm -hmm. and I get to a point where through my experimentation I realise, wow, this is true. It yeah. works. Yeah. It, it, and, and it becomes a conviction inside of your soul then mm-hmm. that cannot be removed by anyone or anything. Yeah. So now it's solid within you. And it doesn't matter how much attack you receive, how much a, a opposition you receive, how much agreement or disagreement you have, <laughs> you will still agree. You will still believe it. Yeah. Because it is true. Yeah. And it's been confirmed as truth to you through your own experience. Yeah. That is the way that truth enters your soul. Unless you're willing to go through the process of experimenting with it, yep. which does involve to a degree uh, taking some risks yes. and potentially making mistakes. But yep. if you think about it, if we're acting upon the truth we receive through the conscience, and it is actually the conscience we're receiving the truth via, yep. acting upon it contains no risk yes, <laughs> <laughs> because it's God's truth and therefore it's always going to be proven to be true. Yes. Whereas acting upon truth coming from so-called truth, coming from other sources, yeah. contains risk. It does. Because it might be true, it might not be true. Yeah. What are you going to do if it's not true? <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, and yet isn't it funny that when we are in touch with the conscience, 
very often we experiment with something and these external influences we've spoken about today will often tell us we are making a mistake. Yes. Uh, and that's where we can waver if we're not willing to be humble, which is one of our desires we talked about in session 10. That's right. To release emotions about that. Yes. Because unless we do, we'll lose contact with the conscience and we'll go into this whole self-doubt exactly. situation. We've seen that happen so many times yeah. where a person, we talk about truth with a person, their conscience gets uh, confirmed mm -hmm. that yes, this is a truth. Mm -hmm. They take that into an experiment in yes. their day to day life. Everyone around them, of course, opposes it mm -hmm. because most people are opposed to the truth coming through the conscience. Yeah. So they oppose it. The person then gets triggered emotionally and they and they have fear and other emotions come up, which they are unwilling to experience. Yes. And so what do they do? They say, I was all a big mistake in the first place. Yep. I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, shut it all down. <laughs> shut it all down. Yep. Get rid of that conscience <laughs> thing. Uh, that's the thing that's causing the problem. And yeah. it's not. It's the abuse and the attack and the unloving behaviour of others that's causing that problem yeah. and your willingness to respond to it. That's right. That's causing the problem. So yeah. we need to be honest about those particular things. Now, if we uh, are focused in this example on experimenting with truth, We'll be really logically honest about where the attack is coming from. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, it's not coming from God. <laughs> In fact, never is it coming no. from God. <laughs> it's coming from people who do not want us to follow the conscience. Yes. It's, coming, it's coming from them. And, and then we've got to start considering whether they're being loving or not. Yeah. as a part of our yeah. assessment yeah. and and therefore go through emotions associated with that you know realizing yeah. that certain people are unloving even though god's telling you that this is a loving and truthful thing to do through your conscious mechanism other people are going to potentially disagree with it and while the earth is in the condition it's in mm -hmm. and the people on it i should say are in the condition they're in yeah. it's highly likely that uh, you'll have a deal of opposition regarding the use of your conscience in this manner yeah. but at least you will be personally happy and eventually hopefully other people will notice why and they'll start asking you well, what's going on why yeah. do you why do you think those things are truth and you'll realize ah it's because i didn't only just hear the truth i experimented with it mm. and i actually did something about it yeah mm. beautiful yeah mm. all right well that brings us um to the end of session 11 of our discussion Today we've been focusing on uh, the conscience and external influences that affect our sensitivity to and obedience with our conscience. Mm -hmm. And as a reminder, we told everyone at the beginning, didn't we, that we are all influenced, whether we like it or not. That's right. Uh, and today we've spoken about a lot of untruthful influences that uh, have occurred in our life thus far. Well, let's call them unloving influences. Unloving, yeah. unloving. Mm -hmm. Which they are. That cause us to resist truth or That's deny right. truth or reject truth. And the primary source of truth we've been discussing in the last few sessions is the conscience. Yeah, it's a or, direct... or you could say God's truth via the conscience. Yes, yeah. direct line to God's <laughs> direct truth. Line to God's yeah. truth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, we've been talking about how these influences have affected our condition as it is today yes and how they still have an impact on us developing a desire to be sensitive to our conscience yes so so a person would say well hang on a sec um, i thought we were talking about forgiveness and repentance yes <laughs> <laughs> well the conscience plays a very big role in forgiveness and repentance it does because without the conscience you wouldn't know what to forgive and what to repent for yeah, yeah. so so the conscience is a very important player and in fact, it is the most direct player in the triggers that occur that cause us to eventually forgive others or repent for our own behaviour. So for that reason, we need to discuss it in more detail. And so we need to have a few more discussions mm -hmm. yet about mm -hmm. the conscience and what we're going to discuss with the conscience. Yeah. So the next two sessions, are going to, we're going to look in a lot more detail about the conscience and how it, how, how it works, how it can guide us, its role in re forgiveness and repentance. And then, we, of course, we need to answer some questions that are common questions about the conscience, because I'm sure the people who have already listened for the last two sessions or yep. so would already, or three sessions it's been now, hasn't it? Nine, ten, yes, and today, eleven. That's right. And um, 
they, they would already have quite a lot of questions about how it works, what's going yes. on, what, what is but this the conscience, is that, yeah. how can I tell, <laughs> yeah. all those kind of things. Yeah. And so we'd like to address those particular yes. questions as well, because that's going to help us answer the question associated with, right, what, what goes on with re forgiveness and repentance now? What t starts it? What triggers it? What's going to cause us to do it? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and how the conscience has a, play, a part to play in that process. So, so our last three sessions have been all about the conscience. Yeah, the right. prior five were all about the law of compensation. Yes. The prior three to that were about God's laws, the law of forgiveness and repentance, and how, you know, the emotional process of forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. So by now we should be starting to get a bit of a picture where we're leading. We've talked about the law, which is external to the human yep. of forgiveness and repentance. We've talked about the law, which is external to the human of compensation, yep. which 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 determines what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. And then we've talked about this mechanism in the human soul, yeah. which is the conscience that allows us to hear from God about what is right and what is That's wrong. wrong. Yep. Right. So now we're starting to see a picture now of here's we got right and wrong mm -hmm. from God's perspective. And the conscience is a mechanism telling us internally yep. what is right and wrong. The com compensation is telling us externally Extreme. what is right or wrong. And we have the option now of allowing compensation to do its work mm -hmm. or engaging the processes of forgiveness and repentance that yes. we're going to talk about and uh, that we've already discussed to a, to a degree. That's right. So, so, so in conclusion to our discussion today, you can start to see the important role of the conscience in this process of forgiveness and repentance. Yeah. It is, it is God's primary direct mechanism of sharing what is right and what is wrong with us <laughs> and therefore helping us to determine what it is that we need to be sorry for and what it is that we need to not be sorry for yes. and what it is that other people, we need to forgive, other, forgive people other people for, for and what it is that other people have done right. Yeah. And we can determine these particular things through the connection with the conscience. Yeah. Thank you, darling, yeah. for for your discussion today. Yeah. yeah. No, it's, a, it's I feel the discussion about conscience is really fascinating, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully people have seen like, wow, like we've been talking for ten years, and there's a lot of recordings now for nearly ten years. Yeah. I think more more than that actually, and and yet. No one's ever got to ask about this such important mechanism of the soul. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> and that should tell you <laughs> that most of us are pretty detuned from it. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, um, obviously, that impacts upon our ability to have a closer relationship with God and also a closer relationship with truth. Yeah. 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 All right. <laughs>